Well, last week we, uh, we started up this series as uh, we've entitled it Show and Tell. And really what we're doing through these four weeks is, uh, is almost preparing ourselves as we go out to our various activities in the summer to share about the faith that we have. And as we do that, we're paying close attention first to our lives, the showing part, and also to our teaching, what we tell about our faith, what we say about it. And we're doing that also as we remember that it's not our own ability then that brings about change in the lives of others. No, instead it's the Holy Spirit that works with uh, our, uh, the, our examples, what we say, and then the Holy Spirit actually does the converting, the change in other people. And so with that in mind, we talk about a, l- a little bit about grace here today as we show and tell our faith by offering grace to others. Now, grace is one of these concepts that's easy to kind of hear that word and say, oh yeah, I, I, I know plenty about grace. I'm part of the church. I go to church. I hear that word all the time. But it's important that we understand it fully. And because there's so many parts to what grace truly is, it's important that we understand it and see how even a little bit of grace offered to somebody else can make a big difference. And that's why we look at this story today about grace, really. Matthew chapter 9, as Jesus offers grace and really kind of teaches about it here with this paralyzed man. And so it starts out with verse 2. Some men brought to Jesus a paralytic lying on a stretcher. And seeing their faith, Jesus said to the man, Have courage, son, your sins are forgiven. So just think about this scene here. These people are carrying this guy on a stretcher. Jesus is likely teaching some people. He's doing his own thing. And suddenly these people arrive with this paralyzed man on a stretcher. And what is Jesus' response? Well, you might think that Jesus would, would heal the guy right off the bat and, and, and show that his miraculous power. But instead, Jesus' first response is grace right? And while that's important by itself, being our topic for today, I want to first actually have you notice the result of that grace. What is Jesus' exact words there? He says, have courage, son, because you could even insert your sins are forgiven. So what's the result that Jesus is speaking about? The result of this grace, this forgiveness he's offering the man Well, it's courage. Now, why is that important? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because sin makes us want to hide. Sin is the opposite of courage. Just look at our own lives. Look at biblical stories. Uh, Think about Adam and Eve. When they bring sin itself into the world, what is their response? To go and hide from God. Jacob and Esau, another story that illustrates this greatly. Jacob steals his brother's birthright. And what does he do? He goes and runs away because he's afraid. David and Bathsheba is another one. After David commits this egregious sin, David tries to hide it as well. We do this because we know that sin deserves judgment. And so sometimes instead of confronting our sin, we we think that if we just hide it away or if we ourselves just kind of ignore it, that somehow it'll be better. We know we can't hide from God. And so that's why Jesus says, have courage. Because when we know that grace in our lives, we can have courage. We can have courage because we're not afraid of the outcome of, Of our sin. We can then talk about our mistakes. We can confess our sin freely, knowing the grace that is available to us. In fact, I I came across this great, uh, super cute video uh, that I think uh, is perfect for this situation. So have a look. Did you do anything in the bathroom? Mm -mm. Nothing? Mm -mm. I was putting some lipstick on. And then I was giving my phone. So you put, what'd you put on? A yes, big on. Oh, whose was that? It was, it was my big. Oh, it was? Yeah. Did you ask anybody if you could put it on? 
I asked myself. <laughs> Did you see how it looked? Yeah. Well, how do you, if you could describe it, how would you describe it? No, like. What? Like a noonie was. Like a noonie has thick lips, thick and nice her mom's, and, and he, he, he pretended it hurts. So whose lipstick is that? A uh, mine. You bought it? Yeah. Where'd you buy that? My lipstick? Yeah. I buy it from Home Depot. <laughs> First place I'd recommend to go get lipstick, certainly. It's a super cute video, and despite the fact that maybe she doesn't fully understand that maybe she shouldn't have done that, and it's not a big deal, uh, what's interesting there is actually the dynamic that's going on between this, th this, this girl and her dad. He's talking to her about what she did, and though she might not have any understanding exactly of that what she did wasn't something she maybe should have done, she just talks about it freely with her dad, right? And it, it comes across in a humorous way. But I think the reason why she feels like she can just kind of talk about it is because she's not afraid of her dad. She's not afraid of the consequences or, or that, some, that, that her dad is going to get extremely mad or something like that. She can just talk about it and uh, be a kid. She knows that she is loved by her dad so that she can just talk to him. And I think that's probably because she's experienced being a child who does things wrong certain times. I think she's experienced grace herself. Now think about the paralyzed man in this story. I think that's exactly what Jesus is communicating to this man as well. That he too is loved. That this guy has, has a completely unhindered relationship with Jesus Christ because he is his Lord. And therefore, there is no reason to fear or to hide or to be hesitant to come to Jesus in any way. No, instead, Jesus welcomes him. And that's why Jesus first offers him that grace to calm any fears or hesitations this man might have. But it's interesting that there's actually some in the story who who don't like that grace. They don't like that this man was so freely offered grace in this story. What happens next? Well, at seeing this, the scribes say to themselves that Jesus is blaspheming. Now, why are religious leaders upset? Well, glad you asked again. Because this paralyzed man and Jesus, according to them, he was breaking, they were breaking the rules. And that's the thing about rules. Whenever rules are set up in, a, in kind of a hierarchical way, it's very easy to ignore our own sin. We might know we've broken a rule somewhere, but all we need is somebody who has broken the rule worse or broken some other rule and done something we deem that's worse so that we can then feel self-righteous. And that's exactly what is going on with these scribes, these Pharisees. They're saying things like, well, at least I'm not like this guy. At least I don't do those things. And even though that same grace Jesus offers this man, the Pharisees needed it too. They could have had it as well, but they despised the grace that Jesus offered. Because it leveled the playing field. It no longer would allow them to feel better than this guy. You can see exactly how Jesus feels about it and his reaction to them. He even perceives their thoughts. And Jesus says, why are you thinking this evil in your heart? For which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? But he wants them to know that he has the authority on earth to forgive sins. And so he says to the paralytic, get up, take your stretcher, and go home. And the man got up and went home. So it turns out 
Jesus not only had the authority to do what only God can do, that is, forgive sins, but he had the authority to heal the man as well. But by setting forgiveness and grace at the forefront here, he also teaches us how to offer it freely to others. He is teaching us that that we can offer that same grace and not get stuck in self-righteousness. In fact, here's something else that Jesus says in John chapter 20 about this. Jesus says to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And after saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. And if you, are, if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. In other words, Jesus has empowered us by giving us the Holy Spirit to offer grace. In other words, it's all about grace. Our faith all boils down to this idea of grace. Granted, there may be times where you retain sins. You can't just ignore sin. That's kind of like if you discipline your kids. You might forgive them, but there still may be consequences that come along with it. But forgiveness and grace comes first. Forgiveness and grace is of utmost importance. That's why our time of confession and forgiveness in worship is a staple, because it's such an important thing. And yet, it's not even restricted to that moment. In fact, you don't need a pastor to proclaim that. To proclaim it publicly, we do that. But if someone has confessed their sin, if you see a need for grace to be offered, you can do that. You can say, you are forgiven. You can offer grace. So really through this story of Matthew 9 here, I think Jesus is boiling this idea of grace down to two very simple but also very important things. Really two things you can take home with you about how we might show our faith by offering grace. And so here they are. Firstly, I need grace. In fact, let's repeat that all together. I need grace. Now turn to the person next to you and say that to them. Yeah, that might seem trivial. We might chuckle a little bit. But we're realizing the grace that we need and the grace that we have received. Take a look at Paul's words in 1 Timothy. He says, This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them. But I received mercy for this reason, so that in me, the worst of them, Christ Jesus might demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. Paul's ministry, all of his letters, you can see his entire life after his conversion was filled with grace. It's because he was first filled with grace by his God, by his Lord. It's why he can proclaim without hesitation, I am the worst of sinners, because he has already understood grace. He has already been offered and granted grace grace. And once you understand that for yourself, then you can share it with others. It's kind of like teaching somebody else. If it, it, You first need to understand something well yourself before you can teach it to somebody else. And so I need grace. We all need grace. And that's the second thing, that others need grace as well. And don't turn to somebody else and say, you need grace. This is not fitting for this one. But the goal then of showing and telling our faith isn't to judge somebody else by saying, oh, look at I've, I've noticed a sin in your life. The goal is to love them. 
In fact, even Jesus shows his love for this man in this story in Matthew 9, because not only does he see the man's physical condition and eventually addresses that, but he first sees his heart. He sees right off the bat that he needs grace first, and he loves him even before any kind of confession is offered. And you and I know the heart of people in this world as well, that this world needs grace. Everyone needs grace. So our goal then is certainly to to have that sin be, be visible and to be corrected, but ultimately to offer that grace and love so that the world can react just like the crowd did in this story that they would be awestruck and give glory to God who gives this authority to men. And so we, being given that authority to, to offer grace to others through the power of the Holy Spirit, we show that grace. We get to know others. We form relationships with people. We, we listen. We care. All so that we can offer that grace. Because God's system isn't one of of rules or of consequences even. But instead, it's a system of forgiveness and of grace. We can even hear words like Romans 5 verse 20. Where sin increased, grace increased all the more. You can't out-sin the grace of God. And in an increasingly sinful world... What great news for you and for me and for the world. News to share with others. That grace increases. Because there's lots of people that that live in fear in our world. Maybe even many of us. Fear of making a mistake. Fear of mistakes that they've made. Fear of the truth coming out. But what stops the fear is grace. Grace is what is needed. And grace is why our Savior Jesus came for us and empowered us to go to the hurting, the broken, the messed up people and simply offer that grace. And so let us do that. Let us show our faith in this way by offering grace and not just doing it as something that we do, but doing it as people that we are, people of grace. Because that, after all, is who Jesus is as well. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, you, you are indeed a God of grace. We see that as you sent your own son, Jesus Christ, to be uh, the uh, sacrifice for us on the cross so that grace could be uh, freely offered to us. And so, Lord, we receive that grace with thanksgiving. We, we recognize how we need it day in and day out, and we ask, too, Lord, that then you would fill us with the power of the Holy Spirit to go out and show uh, just what our faith is to us as we offer that grace to one another. And we pray all of this in the name of our gracious Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen.